kanoi mihi ke katoi mahui mai nei. I rongi tēnā ka papo te rā, tēnā koutou. I want to thank uh, Toa, who I've only recently been able to find out how we're connected, uh, to, for really putting the korawai over the work that we're doing. And I also really have to take this opportunity to thank Philippa for continuing to support this kaupapa over many years and for providing the space and the resources for us to do this work. I also want to thank the people I interviewed, a couple of whom are here probably, and particularly acknowledge the contribution of Uncle Ralph Love because the fact that we are here and that some of the things I'm talking about are happening are very much due to that leadership, extraordinary leadership and, and unacknowledged leadership in Wellington. I also want to thank, and particularly in terms of my particular research, to thank Murray Love, who's the chair of the Wellington Tents Trust, because when I talked to him originally about the trust providing support for um, and working with me and what I'm doing, he said, you really have to understand the history. And that is the history. So this is a, a picture of Wellington, I think it's about 1848. What you can see, if you look behind where all those ships are, there's this little scruffy sort of something drawn down by the beach with a bit of gap to the left. And I thought this was really interesting because only a few years after colonisation, we were already rendered invisible. So around that harbour in 1840, there were about seven, just, just in the Wellington City Harbour, there were about seven or eight kainga. But you don't see them. So we're interesting because the Te Atua, Taranaki, Ngāti Toa, Ngāraru, Ngāti Ruanui, had settled this area about 1830, in the, through the 1830s. But we had really only just got settled in, built our cult cultivations, and then all of a sudden the sponsor ships came in and we had enormous change. So what we had was a kind of multi-iwi settlements in Wellington, which is quite unusual. And what happened to us? How do I go down? You can have a look in the uh, Waitangi Tribunal report on this claim, which is very beautifully written and very powerful. But it's a really tough story. It's a tough story for me. What I haven't said is that this is really insider research. And so when I say us and our, sometimes I'm talking on behalf of my interviews and sometimes I'm talking on behalf of myself. So up on the top left is a photograph of part of what was left in 1855 of Tarapa, which had been a major training centre, which had been uh, had huge flax cultivation, so that what you can see, the blank piece at the top, is the Waitangi Swamp, which was a fantastic resource base. It was a, it was a bank. But by the 1850s, we'd gone from having perhaps up to 1,000 people living in Wellington City, Tyson Māori, through to 1850, we recorded about 600. By the 1880s, they talk about 18 people remaining living at Te Aro, and probably about the same number in Pipitea and in Kumutoto. So we lost that resource, we lost those cultivations, we lost the bank, those houses were wiped off the map, literally, and our people were driven out systematically of Wellington. And they talk about Māori remaining, if you look at the history in the 1880s, as though they were just waiting to get rid of the last of us. We were driven out to the Hutt Valley, where we already had strong settlements, and, and it was shown that there was a little cluster still there. And many of our people returned to Taranaki, only to face some pretty challenging things there. And then we kind of drop off the record largely, what I found really interesting in the historical research, until you get to about 1950s, the inward migration to Wellington, which my mother um, experienced. And we now became not only a minority, we became a minority of Māori. From the 18, 1980s, what you see is a turnaround in us starting to assert place. But that is very, very much at an early stage of development. Our experience, I think, is very much on that picture of what was to Aro Pa and what is along the beach now, and that is of being concreted over and was wiped off the map. 
So where are we now? 2016. We're 7% of 7%. So 7% of Māori residents, of, sorry, of Wellington residents are Māori, and only 7% of those uh, are, as Anna pointed out, defined in the sort of iwikaunga mana whenua. So we're a really tiny minority. We also don't have very large numbers, so we've got a very small human resource base to draw on, although we have very high education levels and we've got a lot of strengths too. The Iwi Authority is not traditional Iwi, but the Port Nicholson Block Settlement Trust, which was set up in 2008, and it's got a very, very big task to do. They're working very hard at it. We have also the Wellington Tents Land Trust. You can go and look it up on the, the web because we, it's a very complicated story. We have scattered pepper potted land holdings across the city, but as you see, we haven't got them consolidated. That work is going on. We have land, we're building that land, we're putting it together, but generating income is a real challenge. What could we be doing? These are the kinds of things that I, I talk to my interviews about, or they talk to me about. They talked about participating in governance. That, that When I started the interviews, local government amalgamation was there. It was a big part of it. They talked about community-level governance, and particularly about building up Māori presence in neighbourhoods, urban form and city design. And they also talked about educating the next generation, trying to break down that lack of knowledge. So there's a lot of things that came out of the interviews, but I wanted to pick up one big theme, which I think is really overriding, and I've been a lot of people have talked to me about this, and that's becoming visible. We've been invisible, and yet we were there all along. So we need to understand our own history, our own place. Somebody talked about telling our stories to ourselves. I didn't know about the Tanifa that shaped Wellington. I'm hearing about that from kids. We need to develop, and we are developing, a sense of Tiranga Waiwai. That is, I actually feel like I know something about this place, and I belong here. And this project has, has really increased that sense of understanding. To do that then gives us the position of developing collective identity or identities. We have been scattered, and in fact many of the people who are Iwikanga have come back into Wellington. And we need to assert ourselves as urban Māori. Somebody said, well, what are we if we're not urban Māori? We're Māori, we're urban. And yet, when you read about urban Māori, and I've done a lot of reading about it, we're not there. We're also... I think have been very deculturated. So the challenges, I'm actually ending on kind of a, I realised a bit of a negative note, but I look at it as challenges that we can do something about. We don't have the visibility. We need and we're trying to develop the knowledge, the skills and the individual and collective confidence. Helene Matonga talks about cultural literacy and really it's our own literacy that we're in the process of developing. There's a lot of work going on to develop the human resource space, but that is continuing to struggle. Our representative organisations are new, they're in development, they don't have 150 years, they don't have a long base to draw on. We're working to generate income, and we have to do that before we can start developing things with it. And I guess the big point I want to make is that legislation, policy, regulation struggles to think of us and struggles to understand that sophistication that has talked about really well. We are a complex place. We need the system to be fit for 2016 and beyond. We need land legislation, resource management, to think about not just an old model, a rural model of iwi, but how we are now. What I do see is commonality between the presentation that was done in this book by Naomi Blair, and I think we link to the people in other cities as well. Our experience is contingent, it's distinctively different in many respects, but I think if you talk to people in New Plymouth, Tauranga, Christchurch, you would find some of the same themes. Kia ora.